literally been to Valley. Okay, next one. All right. Is there anywhere else that you might see them located, either Central Booking or Del Valley? Uh, Travis County Jail. And so the complex downtown that where we have our court system, so you've got, the buildings are all joined, right? right? So you've got the criminal court building and the Travis County Jail is next to it. And then Central Booking is part of the underground part between the jail and the courthouse. Um, there's a dock where they drive in to drop you off. and <laughs> You come in and you're actually in Central Booking where you're processed. Um, the cool thing about it is I've been in practice, like I said, I'm going on 27 years, and two years ago, I finally got to see some cool looking. They will never <laughs> let us in there, but my, my sweet daughter, who was in seventh grade at the time, one of the judges arranged a tour for the children of the jail, and I got to go, and so <laughs> I have to tell you how exciting that was, because otherwise we're kind of banned as defense attorneys from the jail, it feels like, and so um, it was really interesting to see what some cool looking looks like, because my clients would always try to describe it, but I couldn't really picture what it was. So very, very helpful. Um, but this slide right here, I want to point out. So it says right here under bond amount, 2,500 in the type of bond. Um, no sentence, no disposition. So what's important about this is that if you don't have a bond set, we can't get you out, okay, and, unless some time has passed. And so it's critical for a bond to have been set. So when you're pulling up this information, and it says 2,500, any type of bond, even better, versus if there's a limitation for a bail bond, versus you can't have a personal bond. Um, having the bond is, is important. Um, and so let's go to that side. All right. So hopefully y'all can see this. It's like it was either make a million slides or make it a little bit smaller. And so basically, there's a whole process when you go through um, being arrested, getting a bond, and getting out of jail. And so the way that that works is that if you don't have a bond amount set, and that's what happens when you first come in, you pull them up, there's no bond. And so you're continually like looking at this website, like when is my client going to get a bond? In order to get a bond, they have to go in front of the magistrate judge and the magistrate judge has to review a PC affidavit and whatever paperwork the officers dropped off and determine it, is there enough here to charge this person with a crime? And then if so, to set a bond amount that they can use to get out of jail. So that process can take anywhere from, I would say, an hour to all day to, if the client is unlucky and the paperwork's not dropped off, 24 to 48 hours, which I'll talk about in a sec. And so if there's not a bond set, I would say the first thing that you do is, honestly, you can do this regardless of whether or not the bond is set, but you call pretrial services. So pretrial services is the county entity here in Travis County that manages all personal bonds and they determine whether or not someone is eligible for a personal bond. We are very fortunate here in Travis County that there are a lot of personal bonds that are given out um, for people that are arrested. And that's very important because the fees for a personal bond are significantly lower than if you have to get a bail bondsman to bond you out. And so pretrial services is where you start. You would give them a little call and say, um, I have someone that's been arrested. I'm trying to get some information um, on where they are in this process. And they're going to say, do you have a booking number? And you're going to say, yes, I do. And so um, they're going to ask you for that. Now, before I move on, I would say when you're refreshing that screen and there's like no bond that's been set, there's a good chance that that paperwork was not filed by the officer at the point that your client was dropped off. And so in order to find that out, pretrial services may have an idea about whether or not there's a PC affidavit. Um, or if not, you can call the sheriff's bonding desk. Um, and sometimes they'll answer that number and sometimes they won't. They do more often these days. Um, but they can tell you whether the PC affidavit has been filed. Because if there's no PC affidavit, there's no magistration, there's no bond being set, and your client is stuck. So yes, bond amount. Next step would be to call pretrial services and say, I'm calling about this person in custody and they have a bond amount that's been set. Are they approved for a personal bond? Um, if pretrial services says yes, um, at that point, that's where things like, I guess, have changed a lot since COVID. And so there was a time before COVID where if somebody had been approved, but their paperwork had not gone anywhere yet and not gone in front of the judge for a signature on that bond, as an attorney, I could pop down to the jail Take up the paperwork, take it to the judge, they get the pretrial, turn it into the bonding desk, and really speed up the process to get out of jail. Now they've they've done it on their own. Thanks to COVID, they've really sped up that process in terms of like trying to get it through. And so um, once somebody's approved, it goes a lot faster because they don't want them 
there in the gel, like it's exposing people being exposed, that kind of stuff. So that's been a blessing to come out of the last year. So okay. can, do, you, do you have to tell people you're representing them to get that information about, or you can just say I'm a family member and I'll tell you all about it. They will talk to family members, they will talk to staff, um, and that's another thing that I should say, as a staff person, um, you can put a letter on file with the sheriff's office um, and with pretrial as somebody that's authorized to drop off and pick up bonds. And so we have that all the time where if we can't go, we can actually send our runner, if it's, you know, our runner that we trust, staff, paralegals, assistants, legal assistants, um, but definitely somebody that's, that's within the attorney's employ um, to go do that. And so it, it really just depends on the situation. But like I said, they're emailing us the bonds now, yeah. which they didn't used to do. I mean, they made it so much easier and so much faster. Do you have a question? So when the website says any type of bond, uh, you still need to call free trial to see if they're approved for a personal bond because that website won't really tell you if they are. Not. Yeah, absolutely. So any so the magistrate is the one that determines whether or not you are eligible for a um, personal private bond, private bond, which means you promise to appear in court, but you don't have to actually put up money. Um, a surety bond would mean that you have to go to a bail bondsman, 10% of the face value of whatever bond was set. Um, and sometimes you'll see restrictions on there where it says cash or surety, meaning that they have to post the entire amount or get a surety um, to post the bond. Or um, sometimes we do something different, which really requires an attorney where it's a percentage cash bond. And those are situations when you're looking at, at a cash bond um, or a high bond, we probably are going to need an attorney to get involved because it's a serious charge or they've got some, something with their history that's causing a problem. Um, so what I would say is this. And so once they've been, um, once they've been approved for a personal bond, let's start there. Um, at that point, like I said, it's been going through the process pretty quickly. But the question becomes, how do you know where they are in the system? Well, if what you'll see is when you look them up where it says disposition, it'll say uh, the date, which will usually be the date that, you know, that you're talking to them, um, and personal bond. And so that's super helpful because as you're checking the computer, once you know they've been approved, pretrial is processing the bond, it's sending it through the system, um, you're literally just waiting for that to come up that says that there's been a disposition with the personal bond, um, or if a bail bondsman was posting for them, it would say surety bond. How quickly does the system update um, compared to real time? I would say that it's pretty fast. There have been occasions where it, it wasn't as fast, um, but they're pretty good about putting it in the computer as they're processing the bond paperwork at the sheriff's bond desk. And so, and one of the things that Sheriff Fernandez said a few years ago when she came in is she kept the same deputies at the bonding desk and they were rotating them out before that. And so it was her miss in terms of how bonds were being processed, but she's really keeping the same staff there. So they're like so much better. They're really good at getting those bonds taken care of and entered in the system. And so that is like super helpful. Um, but once you see that the personal bond um, has been posted or the surety bond has been posted, it can be anywhere from 30 minutes to six hours. And I say that because if it's a slow day at the jail, then release a discharge is going to get the paperwork through pretty quickly and they're going to be released. Um, if not, then uh, it could literally be hours. Once I hit like a two or three, well, I guess it depends. Once it hits about a three hour mark, I'm actually calling the bonding desk and, and asking like what the status is to make sure that something hasn't happened. But this is very helpful for family members also to be able to like look online and see if there's a disposition and kind of know that because their first impulse is to run down to the jail and, and camp out because they're waiting for their loved one to be released. And I'm like, okay, the bond has been posted, but you know, it, it could be like a while wait for, wait for your loved one to call you. Um, the other thing I would say is that if there's a problem with a personal bond being granted, there are definitely situations where with an attorney's signature, the judge will grant it anyway, and this is going to save the client's money. And so, like for my practice, if I do a jail release, um, any fees that I charge actually go toward the representation because I'm saying that I'm representing that client um, as a part of getting them out of jail. But that said, personal bond fees, um, <laughs> this is literally what's on the bond, the 1334. And so if the bond amount that the judge has set is less than $13.34, then it's a $20 fee with pretrial services to have a personal bond. Over that, it's a $40 fee. Um, on DWI cases where they have ignition interlock, they have to be monitored on like a higher level. And so it's basically 3% of the value of the, the bond that was set. And so um, those, those are the small fees that are associated with personal bonds. For bail bond spends and sureties, 
it's 10% of the face value of the bond that they normally charge. And sometimes it's more than that if they feel like there's like a problem with the person being secured and showing up for court because they're on the hook, you know, financially if they don't. Um, the other thing is that I, I copied this one because I came across it when I was like looking at the share stuff to find screenshots for today. But see how it says failure to ID class C misdemeanor? Um, and it says bond zero, but there's a disposition for a personal bond. I thought I would just point this out because it's kind of interesting. On class C cases, they can't force you to post the bond. If they actually arrest you and take you to jail, they have to release you on your own signature with a promise to appear at your court date. And so that's why that one actually says that there's a disposition, but no bond. But it's important to know because every once in a while, some of these little municipalities will try to say, oh, no, you have to post money for your loved one to be released from the jail. That's not true. The sheriff's going to release them if it's only a class C. Um, and they're just going to give them a court date. So. So they arrest them, take them to jail, and then immediately release them if it's a class C? Well, I wouldn't say immediately, but they're processing them. <laughs> <laughs> it's never immediately. Once you go, I can't go and get you. And so, you know, you're there. Um, okay. Before I move on, anybody have any questions about jail release or anything that they'd like to know? Okay. Well, I, I thought in your PowerPoint before you said that, because I've gone to pick up uh, friends, kids, and, we, and I didn't know I could do this. I was sitting outside for like four or five hours, so it could be up that time kind of period. Yes, and what I what I always tell family is once we see that the bond has like been posted in the computer, because I can tell them I've dropped it off at the bonding desk, right? But once we see it's on the computer, at that point, we know that um, it's in the system, it's headed to release and discharge, and you know it could be really fast or it could be hours. And so I always tell people, I said, look, People, once they get out of jail, they're, they're very, like, good at finding a phone and calling someone to pick them up. And so I've never had somebody not be able to find a phone. They will walk to somewhere nearby. And so I always tell them, just, you know, you can go wait if you want to, but I would wait until somebody gets a phone call and then head down there, because otherwise it literally could be hours, right? Um, if they're out at Del Valley, they just release them with, like, a bus ticket, which is interesting. <laughs> okay, let's see. All right. So, um information gathering on a criminal case right and so um these are the two systems which if you do civil you're probably already familiar with anyway um but if you're looking at felony cases that information is going to be with the district clerk's office if you're looking at misdemeanor cases um, that's going to be with the county clerk's office um as you may or may not be aware me talking to you today they're completely upgrading their system to odyssey and so it's down or it's going to be down no it's down <laughs> and so yeah, yeah. i haven't looked at it I want everybody know it is down well and then you probably got the email also that even if you already signed up for attorney access with the district clerk you're going to have to re-sign up again so that will be that um but what's exciting to me is that for the um, misdemeanor cases which are in the county court which most dwis are um hopefully once odyssey goes online we're really hoping to be able to get access to a pc affidavit and that kind of stuff without having to go to the clerk's office, email the clerk's office, call the clerk's office, like we're having to do right now. And so hopefully these links will still work after this week. If not, um, Google will probably help you out. Um, next slide. Okay, so for those of you that have not logged into the district clerk's office before, it's an attorney access portal, whether it'll look like this after this week, I don't know. Um, but you definitely want to have attorney access because at least for the felony records, we've always been able to get copies of them once they've been entered into the system. Um, I will say this, sometimes if you're trying to get a copy of a PC affidavit um, and it hasn't been entered in the system, you can call either the clerk's office and they'll go track it down for you. Um, that's when you're trying to find it for somebody that's stuck in jail, I would say. That's like, all right. Misdemeanor record search. This is like the slash page for that. Um, you have to have the client's first and last name, and you have to put an offense date. So I usually just put like a really far back offense date to like the end of the year, um, because without the dates, it won't come up. But this is how you look to see basic information about the case in terms of like what's happened. So this is also um, a very common name. And we see that Mr. Jones has two cases for theft that fortunately were dismissed, which is good. Um, but basically, if you enter someone's information, especially with their date of birth, it will show you all the cases that they have pending or any cases that have been dismissed. When you click on either one of those two cases, then it's going to take you to the individual case and you'll be able to see a history of what's happened in the case. And so this can be very helpful. A lot of times we don't really see like the pleadings and stuff that's been filed, so we'll have to go back to the file for that. 
Um, but it is very helpful in terms of seeing all the settings that a case has had. Um, if somebody walks into your office, and especially if they've had a different attorney or they're changing attorneys and you're trying to see like what's happened, that's good. Um, but it's also nice when you're looking at old cases with the history to see like what's been dismissed, how it got there. Um, but basically that's, it's a limited amount of information. Um, and it sometimes will tell you also when you click on it, like which court it's been assigned to, but not always. And I think that this is just an older case why, which is why we're not seeing that. I think. All right. So I've been talking about the PC affidavit. I assume that people know what that means, but basically it's probable cause affidavit. And so if you're arrested for a crime, in order for you to be taken to jail and held, the officer has to um, basically fill out an sworn statement saying what crime you committed with the details about that. Um, that is part of public information in a case. It's filed with the clerk's office. Um, some of the bonding information is in the clerk's file, the court's file, and also um, any pleadings that are filed, but all of the <clears throat> other information that tells you really what happened um, is going to be in a different place and not available to the public. Um, but I will say this, you know, clients are always concerned who can find out what's happened to me about my case. You know, the PC affidavit is, is public information. And so we can give a copy of that to the client. So it's helpful. A lot of times, whatever's in the PC affidavit is also in the offense report. So that's good. Um, but it, it is kind of the critical document in terms of most cases and kicking them off. Um, and so that, that is like, I don't know, the, the starting point in terms of the information for the case and something that um, oftentimes we get before we meet with a client for the first time so that we can like give it to them and they can see like what the officer said happened versus, you know, what they said happened or what maybe happened. Okay, next slide. All right, tech share. And so if you have done criminal defense, this is gonna be obviously very familiar. If you have not, this is the discovery portal. And this is basically how we get information on our clients' cases. Um, I have a wonderful friend of mine from law school that practices in San Antonio. And he occasionally takes a case here in Austin because he likes to come up here. But I swear to God, every time he does, he forgets about tech share. So he calls and he's like, how do I get the police report? I'm like, is it in tech share? What? I'm like, oh, really? And so anyway, I probably need to send him this PowerPoint, quite frankly, <laughs> or actually send it to his, you know, his paralegal because she sometimes calls me too. So anyway, this is the splash page where you have to have an account set up um, and the attorney like logs in from here. And so once you log in, these little white boxes are the missing information because obviously I needed to log into my account. So my clients don't really want me to share all their stuff. Um, but essentially what you see, this is just part of the screen that's displayed, but it's the case information um, and it gives you the basics. Um, there's certain numbers that are really helpful in criminal cases beyond the case number, like the TRN, um, the prosecutor that's assigned is like super helpful, especially these days since we're not allowed to go to court. Um, it saves a lot of time to be able to know which prosecutor is like assigned to the case at any given time without having to email people to find out. TRN. Um, it is, oh Lord, you're going to ask me that. What does TRN stand for? That's a good question. It's it's basically like a SID number. Both of those are identifiers in the court system and the sheriff system. And so for the court system, the TRN is needed on certain disposition paperwork. Um, and so you have to know where to find it. Used to, we'd have to get the clerk's file and look at the front of the clerk's file to find it. Now it's on tech share, which is awesome. Um, this is actually just further down the same page. This is This is a list of the documents that are available in the client's case. And so um, all you have to do is like click on it and then it downloads to your computer. So this is beautiful. It gives you all of the information. Um, you're subject to regulations under 3914 of the Code of Criminal Procedure where you can't just like physically give this to your client and say, have fun and go home, that you can show it to them but they can't have it. But essentially this is videos, this is the PC affidavit, it's in here, the arrest report, um, any photographs that they've taken, Everything goes in here. Sometimes emails between the prosecutor and like the complaining witness. Um, well, not that one, I'm sorry. Someone else that they've reached out to, they will put in there. They'll usually redact the other one. Um, but basically all of the information for the case is in here. And then it's got like dates that shows you when it's available, when you last accessed it, accessed it, accessed it. <laughs> and, um, and it's very, very helpful. Obviously it's critical that you have this in order to be able to get the information. Why can't you give this to your client? It, it seems like if it involves them, then they should the, be able to the, have it. The documents or like a printout of this page? The documents. Yeah. So basically it's only been a few years ago that we actually had a discovery law that was put into effect on the books, courtesy of the whole Michael Morgan case. 
And so whereas civil lawyers get everything between both sides, like you're entitled to all of it. For years in like criminal defense, we got almost nothing. So I have been practicing a long time, but you know, back in like 1995, <laughs> so we would go and the prosecutor would have the information in their file and we could open up it up and we could look at it, but we weren't even allowed to get a copy of the offense report. We'd have to sit there with a notepad and take notes off the offense report and even watch DWI videos in a conference room and not get a copy of that. And so we moved forward from to get, we moved forward from there to, we could take the prosecutor's file behind the courtroom and make copies ourselves. <laughs> so we had to be very efficient at making copies um, and we could, request a copy of the video, but we've really completely gone past that with the Morton Act because essentially what it did was it guaranteed certain rights for us to absolutely be able to have the information. And then beyond that, um, it created obligations on us once it was given to us. And so it's different for pro se defendants. There's there's other rules that like kick in, but you don't really have pro se defendants in criminal cases. They still appoint someone to manage them. And so um, essentially, my client can come in and they can see all the information. I just can't give them a copy of it. Now, with the DWI video, we can actually request that straight from the police under a different statute and give them a copy, but it's not the same video. It doesn't have functionality for whatever reason. And so um, it's, it's the give and the take of it. The good news is, is that, you know, on the criminal side, we're not on a reciprocal discovery obligation. So we do have to disclose, like, you know, our experts and things like that, but we don't necessarily have to show them everything that we have, like you do in civil. So there's that. Um, the other thing that you'll see in text share that I wanted to point out is um, if a plea offer has been made in the case, um, then they will go ahead and they will put that in the computer. Um, you want it in the computer so that you can, if you have, the prosecutors frequently switch between different courts. <laughs> so it's really important if one of them gives you an offer that it's in the computer in text share because if they go to a different court, they may not remember and it, it gets dicey from there. And so, um, Sometimes you'll see updates to the plea offer. Um, sometimes it won't be in there and you have to email them and remind them to please put it in there. But that's another important part of the portal is that it will show you um, the offer and if there's subsequent offers, they're in there by date. Um, and, you know, it's, it's nice, especially when you've got like an offer for dismissal, you won't have memorialized in texture. Do you um, have to be the attorney of record to access the tech portal or? No, you can, you can assign administrative people from your office. And so, you have to go through um, you have to go through TechShare and they have to be like you have to go through the administrative part of the account. Um, but you should be able to sign not only your staff but investigators um, to be able to log in. Um, but obviously the attorney is responsible for whoever has been given that permission and what they do with the information. So there's that. Um, but yeah, I mean there's lots of people that, that wind up doing that for their staff. Um, but I have a feeling most staff probably just log in through the attorney's login because don't tell well <laughs> <laughs> right. change all the I know. <laughs> okay. Oh, she knows. Um, so <laughs> docket search application has actually become a little bit more important in COVID times because pretty much the courthouse is like under <laughs> lockdown still here in Travis County. Not in Williamson County or faster for other no, places, no. but definitely in Travis. And so what's interesting, so this is not my client. I just put in John Jones again. This is what I, I got. I got Mr. Sanders' client here. <laughs> so anyway, not mine. Um, so the docket search um, application, which you can get through that link right there, will basically show the next court date in a given case. And then what's critical these days is whether or not they expect you to show up at the courthouse. Typically, they don't. Um, as you can see with this one, so we've got John Mon Manuel, Manuel Jones. Um, he basically apparently doesn't have an attorney yet, but he is not expected to appear. His case is unindicted. Um, but with Mr. Sampson's attorney, he is expected to appear. Um, and it looks like he's got a plea setting. So the most likely explanation for why they want him in court is that he's actually going to um, enter a, a final plea, at least on that particular case, um, with the court. And he probably, I don't think that they're going to the courtroom yet. So he'll probably actually just be down with the sheriffs in a very special Zoom room. <laughs> with or without Mr. Sampson, um, I always go with my clients, but anyway, uh, he will basically probably be appearing there versus in the courtroom because I think they've been keeping them out of the courtroom. And the, um, isn't the reason, well, they're doing that is so they can take the fingerprints at the time. They do, and if you do a plea in absentia, then like they don't have to go. Yeah. And so there's different parameters for being able to do that. I don't know how many they're doing on like felons, um, but yeah, to your point, I mean, they really, 
they really they don't want you there but if you are going to be there then they're going to like put you in the little room and you know it's so the sheriff i mean it's, it's similar to how like, being in the courtroom and having like the sheriff there to keep a order or whatever only you're in the little zoom room <laughs> to finish your paperwork i try to keep my clients out of the zoom room if we're doing something like that i try to do the queen of silicia to to do every and i've been successful in doing that um and with our, our new administration very successful with dismissals which has been really nice uh, but anyway this is very helpful if you're trying to sort out whether or not somebody has a court date where they actually have to show up regardless all right. um, I would just point out that for criminal cases, um, sometimes it's hard to see like what's been filed in the case if you're not actually looking at the court's file. But in case you didn't know, e-file actually has a function where it shows you like the filing history in the case. And so civil lawyers may know that a lot better than criminal lawyers um, in terms of like those practices. But I thought that that's like very helpful that you can actually go to e-file and see what is the state file? What have I filed? Did the state file anything that I didn't get a copy of? You know, without having to physically go to the, the clerk's office to like look at the file. That was very helpful. Okay. So this may be my favorite thing to talk about because um, hopefully all of you are aware, but in January of this year, we got a new district attorney and we got a new county attorney. So our new district attorney is Jose Garza and our new county attorney is Delia Garza. And I have to tell you that it's a criminal defense attorney that has been practicing for all this time. I never thought in all of my practice that I would see the policies and programs that have been put in place that are just wonderful, wonderful for people that are arrested. And so I will say this, 95% or higher of my clients have never been arrested before. I have a heavy DWI practice and most of my clients are everyday people that like literally they're pulled over, they've been drinking off to jail, they go, maybe they, they, they're intoxicated, Sometimes they're not, and so you go anyway. But having a criminal history is like very damaging with all of the, you know, background searches that are run when people apply for jobs and stuff, and anyone can accuse you and you get arrested, it's on there. And so what we're seeing now are some really great policies, and they are going to make a huge impact on people. And what I'd seen over the last, I would say, 10 to 15 years is what I would call a criminalization of our, our population and our citizens where we're taking people that would normally never have a criminal record and with either DWI or assault family violence cases where literally the neighbor can call if they think that you're yelling at each other and somebody can be taken off the jail and here's your case. And so those were two areas where I felt like we were really seeing criminal histories and, and cases created for people where they would not otherwise be labeled as criminals, right? So I wanna talk about the county attorney first. Um, I swear I love that woman. She has just come in and she has put people in place that are so positive um, and programs in place that have made a huge difference. And so I wanted to just talk about that um, briefly. So one of the things that wasn't happening before that they are really, they're going to try to make it 24 seven, but they're definitely doing it during the week is when people come in and they've been arrested, they have a prosecutor that is looking at those PC affidavits and they're trying to make sure that if it's a case that they don't think they would move forward with anyway under their new policies, they're kicking it out of jail. That is so awesome. That is so important for the person that's been arrested. Um, they're released without a bond. Their case has been kicked. And so that's that's a super critical check that we need on the police because even though they're probably not arresting as many people these days in Austin, um, it's, it's a very important part of justice in our justice system. So that's been put in place. Um, Pretrial diversion has just gotten this great makeover. And so pretrial diversion um, is a statutory situation where you sign an agreement with the prosecutor's office, um, you promise to follow those agreements, um, either at the time you sign it, or it can be a period of time later, the case is dismissed and you have statutory right to expunge your records, which is the process to erase them. Um, one of the things that they did with DWI where they really updated it so critical, in, in Texas, if you get arrested for a DWI, it's class B misdemeanor, one step up from a traffic ticket, um, punishable by six months in jail, $2,000 fine. Um, but if you have a breath or alcohol test that's over 0.15, there's an enhancement on that of um, a class A misdemeanor. So they step it up, it's an, it's an enhancement. The reason I'm pointing that out is because prior to January of this year, with our previous county attorney, if you had a 0.15 or higher on a DWI case, um, no pretrial diversion, period. Um, and honestly, usually no offers for reduction unless you really, 
you really had some things going for you in your case. Um, and so now if it's if it's under a two, a point two zero, um, and no accident, they're pretty much eligible for pretrial diversion um, for that DWI. And so that is like, you know, for somebody that's made maybe one mistake and there's no accident, no one was put in harm's way, this is so important for their case. The other thing that they did though that I'll say that's part of the update is that they lowered the amount of time on pretrial diversion from 12 months to six, which is critical. And the other thing is, is they want alcohol monitoring while you're on pretrial diversion, but I gotta tell you, there's different types of alcohol monitoring. So there's, you know, most people are familiar with ignition interlock, which is the device they put on your car. Um, but there's this handheld device called PAM, personal alcohol monitor. And she is not a nice girlfriend to have, I have to tell you. <laughs> she requires attention four times a day. And that attention is required these days within about a one hour window for most of them. And if you don't give her that attention by giving her a test within that one hour window, it's a missed test. Under the old DWI pretrial diversion, it was a year of being on PAM glowing four times a day. And we're talking early morning, late at night, and a couple of times in between. So you no know, going to bed early, no sleeping in late, got to blow in a pan. And if you had more than two missed tests over 12 months, you were kicked out of the program. <laughs> so, I mean, that was like, I had clients that didn't do it. I mean, they were like, give me a different offer for some other resolution on my case because I cannot do this for a year, right? Um, so anyway, that was, in my opinion, a super important um, update. Um, but the other cool thing is that when you file a case um, with the police, it creates it. When they file the official charging document, which on misdemeanor cases is called an information, that allows the case to go forward. But expunctions and other things are treated differently based on whether or not that's filed. So it's helpful if you can dispose of the case before the information is filed. It's not critical, but it's just really helpful. They're literally looking at cases and automatically sending offers for pretrial diversion on DWIs when they meet all of this criteria without filing the information, which is great. Even if the information is filed and you're somewhat out of the range for an automatic offer, the attorney, um, technically the client per se, but the attorney can apply. Um, and they're even considering cases where I have clients that were over 0.15 and they hit like a parked vehicle and restitution was made and no one was hurt. And they're getting the pretrial version, which is especially great when you've got a college student that really doesn't need to have a criminal record and we um, are able to get that opportunity. So, um, the other thing I would say is that in terms of all of the dismissals that we're seeing with the county attorney's office, and there are a ton of them that are going on. Um, the emphasis is on nonviolent offenses. So before y'all worry about people that are assaulting people or, or things like that, um, I would say that the family violence course has not changed as much. Um, really, they're still focused on a protection position. But what they're really doing is, is they're dismissing anything that's nonviolent, um, theft, all of that stuff. A lot of it's just getting kicked. Um, it's, it's definitely a different approach to justice. Um, and they're still considering you know, history and, and things like that at the top of part. But it's been great. Um, expunction, I, I'll finish with her by saying, so expunction is where you actually, you sue in the district court for a legal right to have all of your records erased by all the entities holding it. Um, sometimes you can't get to all of those entities, but it's, it's an important tool to have in your toolbox. There are statutory waiting periods that are created um, in the code. And so a lot of times clients like will have a case dismissed or disposed, disposed of, but they've still got it on their record when they're trying to get a job because they can't expunge it yet they have pretty much waived all the waiting periods by agreement. And so, you know, they're letting expunctions be filed left and right. And that is like so helpful for clients in terms of starting them on a path to not have this on their history. And once an expunction is granted, you have the legal right to say you haven't been arrested. So, I mean, that's, that's really important for people. And it's a beautiful thing to see that they're doing for, you know, people that really, really deserve that second chance. District Attorney's Office, I'll keep it short. Um, I've got it in the slide here. Um, basically, they followed a similar path. Obviously, they're dealing with felonies in cases that are a lot more serious than the misdemeanors in the county attorney's office. But they are also engaging in arrest and review, um, kicking cases if they feel like, you know, the officer shouldn't have filed it. Um, I can't tell you when I was looking through the sheriff inmate site, because I was looking for what I wanted to screenshot, how many cases where the person had been released by order of the district attorney as an agreement to allow, allow them to be released while they were in further investigating their case, which is super important for people that, that don't have the ability to post what would be a high bond amount for a felony case. Um, so that's something that they're doing. These pretrial diversion areas that you're seeing right here, um, most of these, unless there's some kind of enhancement are like state jail felonies. So these are like the lowest like felony like level um, of offense, like six months to two years in jail kind of 
range. Um, but the big emphasis that they've had is decriminal decriminalization of drug offenses. And so most people don't realize that if they've got any amount of, say, cocaine, I mean, it can be recreational, that's automatically a felony. Um, and there's other drugs that are like that too, um, like certain like, um, like hashish oils and stuff like count differently than say like marijuana, like in a, a cigarette. And so you really can get yourself into felony trouble without an appreciation that you are committing a felony. Um, and, and be arrested and, and be charged. And so what they're really trying to do is, um, unless you're like a, a drug dealer, I mean, you're literally dealing drugs or you've been dealing them to children, um, they really, what they're really doing is they're trying to decriminalize it without the legislature, you know, having to pass a statute to do that. Um, okay, yeah. The last thing that I will wrap up with, because um, y'all may want to have the rest of your meeting too. Um, so we have specialty courts and a lot of times people don't know about specialty courts and they may or may not affect your practice. Um, but these are like the four main areas of specialty courts. And so mental health is its own specialty court. If somebody has a mental illness, and especially if it had an impact um, on them getting arrested or them being able to be on probation or any of those things, um, there's a whole mental health docket, both for the um, misdemeanor and felonies. Um, and those cases are treated very differently. So if you had a client that came to you, I actually don't handle mental health cases um, because there's a lot of boxes that have to be checked and there's attorneys that do that. And so I don't in my practice. But if you have a client that comes to you and they, they've got a mental health issue and you definitely want to have them on the mental health docket to get a special consideration. Um, veterans court is pretty cool because a lot of our veterans have um, PTSD and other problems that, that cause them to wind up having a criminal case. And in veterans court, it's a really neat program where pretrial diversion can be offered, other avenues to avoid a conviction, but they actually, they were meeting the person, but they actually meet with other veterans that have also been in a similar situation and it creates community for them, um, for the struggle that they're having. And we've just seen beautiful things happen in veterans court. I've had some clients that I've been in veterans court that have really benefited from it. So great program. Project Engage is really cool. That um, misdemeanor courts is Judge Mueller. So when we have people that are in that like 17 to like 19 range really um, that are in the adult system, they're, they can be pulled into this court um, as an opportunity for like, I guess more rehabilitation and to make sure that they're not headed down the wrong path. That Judge Mueller does cool things like she gets Matthew McConaughey to come visit them and, and stuff like that. <laughs> and so it's been a super positive program. Um, BWI court is when people get in a lot of trouble and pick up more than the BWI at the same time, and they need to have a disposition on both of those cases, and they're offered an opportunity by going and participating in the BWI court to get a better outcome than they might have otherwise, or if we had to try both of the cases. Um, does anybody have any questions at this point? What counties do you practice in? So I'm primarily based in Travis County. Um, I do not go to Hayes County. Um, I'll go to. <laughs> <laughs> so it's getting worse over there, so I hear. Um, so I go to Hayes County to try cases. Um, and so I practice here. I will take cases in Williamson County from time to time. It, it depends on who it is. Um, and I will take cases in Bastrop County from time to time. I have to say that I probably should be taking more cases in Bastrop County, but it's like, you know, the way that they're in their docket makes it a little bit harder to appear, I feel like. But I mean, for the DWIs that I've had out there that have been pretty spectacular, where you're talking like over a 0.2 on breath, which is, you know, legal limits 0.08. So like, let's start multiplying by three. I've gotten dismissals. And so I love practicing there. I love the prosecutor out there, but it's not the easiest, like, for my schedule to practice out there. Anybody else? And then you didn't mention, or maybe they'll have any more drug court. Do they have that as a specialty court, or is that no longer? I don't. I don't think that they're doing it with a few programs, but I won't say that they're not. Okay. okay. Um. I I know that they have they have shoved so much into pretrial diversion. Um. That from what I've seen come out, so I don't know if you're on the listserv, but I mean, a lot of the information that I'm getting is from the listserv, right? Because unfortunately, we're not allowed to go to court, and so and we're somewhat limited in like communicating with each other. And so, um, I I think that a lot of those drug cases have been pushed off to pretrial diversion. Now, there's like the last thing that I saw, there's like three traps for felony pretrial diversion, and so that may dictate what happens with it. Um, but I didn't, I don't know is what the answer to that. You would have to look at that. Ariel sent out a memo on the listserv <laughs> recently, and so you'd have to. And then this is my last question, and I've been very proud of Travis County in regards to the pre-trial conversion and dealing with 
happening, but unfortunately, I think the legislators are pushing back with the new bond bill. Have you looked at that to see what impact that's going to have on what you've been talking about? You know, I haven't because I'm basically waiting for TCDLA or, you know, even ACDLA, but really TCDLA to like make a statement about it. Okay. Um, we have, without going off on a tangent, I kind of feel like at this point in the last year or two, we kind of devolved from following the law. And so I don't, you know, people are just making it up and doing what they want. And so I don't know what the judges are going to do with it, to be quite honest with you. Um, I think in Travis County that they're more open-minded. And so they would definitely be willing to push it as far as they can to make sure there's not an adverse consequence to someone that's in custody. Um, but obviously the way that it's implemented is going to be different from county to county. You know, here you're going to get a broad reading of it and a different outcome than in a very conservative county yeah. where they're like, we're going to leave you in jail forever, right? Okay. Anybody else? Um, there's one question from Zoom. <laughs> this person says, um, can you repeat what you said about arrests for marijuana in Travis County? They're asking for a friend. <laughs> <laughs> so here's what's interesting i think that in rest and review from what they're when, what i've seen i have a feeling that those cases are being completely kicked and i have to say that i have not seen i have not seen a marijuana case that what that wasn't connected to another criminal case in years they have been kicking those cases they have basically when somebody shows up with a marijuana case that's less than two ounces which if you've got more than two ounces you've got a that's a good amount. But, um, but anyway, unless you've like baked it into something, and then that's really going to get you in trouble if you get caught with it. But um, but anyway, what I would say is that even, even before January of this year, what we were seeing is um, people that just had small amounts, they they would get processed, they would be number one, site and release. So they weren't even taken to jail. They did a walkthrough with JP court. Then they'd show up for the report day. The prosecutor would say, take this 15 hour you know, drug awareness class, bring me the certificate, I'm dismissing this. And so attorneys really have not been needed on marijuana cases for a very long time, um, unless, like I said, it's tied to another case. Um, and even then the officers don't always file them. Um, so you could have marijuana on you, but they've arrested you for DWI and they may not file the marijuana case. Yeah, in our offices since January, any type of cases that we've seen with any kind of drugs, like when they've had an arrest, they've all been declined by the district attorney and yeah, I actually, yeah, and I have a pretty recent DWI where, like, they accused him of, like, you know, using it or what, or marijuana or whatever, and um, there may or may not have been some things confiscated from his car, but, um, but I mean, it was one of those things where there was, like, there were no ancillary charges, and, yeah, yeah. they've just been declining them. Um, a lot of cases, yeah, we've had drug cases tied with other ones, and we get hired on the other case, and mm -hmm. then the other ones just got dropped immediately. Yeah, I am not, I, I really think that you would at this point, you have to be a major dealer or selling to children or doing something like really bad um, because there's there's a huge push to push back on, you know, criminalizing that, which is which is great to see because there's too many people that have gotten criminal records from drugs that, in my opinion, don't deserve to have, you know, especially felonies as part of the history. Um, so anyway, any other questions? I'm curious about the backlog of the files and the impact on the jail. So I will say this, they, last year when everything was like going crazy and people were just terrified, which some probably still are, um, they were trying to get as many people out of the jail as they could, right? Um, and there's some things that happened. And so I think that they're not like doing that as much anymore. Um, I don't have a number for how many people are in jail right now, but getting on, when I was on the sheriff's in my inmate search, I was looking for stuff in my PowerPoint. And so I'm clicking through all these like random cases and I was, I was literally shocked by how many people are in jail. There's a lot of people still in jail and so and they're stuck they're stuck because they either can't bond out they have holds from other cases that taking care of some of these cases quite frankly is really hard when you're not face to face with a prosecutor and so i've literally for some of my more difficult cases had to have to resort to badgering them for a phone call because the email just doesn't really convey your client in a way that you want it to for the hard cases i'm not talking about the easy stuff but um I don't know. They were they were going to start trials back up in July. That got kicked. They were going to start them back up in October. That I'm pretty confident has been kicked. Um, they met last Friday to talk about when they might start them back up. Um, but I'm hearing maybe January. And so you know, and that's for serious stuff. Because I mean, I I have a trial that was set next week that's kicked to December, right? But a friend of mine who has um, a capital murder setting in October. You know they're not going and, and she's being told january and so it's they're just 
they're stuck. And so I don't, there's definitely speedy trial issues there, but those are still dependent on the higher courts recognizing. So, anybody else? Are those trials all going to, they're all in person then? Trials? Well, and that's the other, that's the other part of it. So Williamson County has started up trials. And one of our courts have started up trials. They like had a trial or two and then you just stopped doing trials. I don't know why. I don't know if you got COVID or what happened. And then like one of the other judges, I mean, I say that because he was like super gun ho and then like all of a sudden it was like, you know, nobody's coming to court. Um, and then some of the other ones have also had trials. And so um, I don't think that there's been any, at least for Williamson, I haven't heard of any outbreaks. There was one in Houston where the inmate was positive, the, the person whose trial it was, and got to sit next to his lawyer for two days before the jail figured it out. Um, but I mean, I, I think that there's still the issue of, you know, the judges, I think, are worried about being exposed. And um, then you also have, are the are the jurors going to show up? The, there was a survey last year done with the clerk's office, the district clerk's office. Um, they sent it out to prospective jurors and said, under what circumstances would you show up for like jury service? Um, you know, mass, no mass, spread out, whatever, right? And at the time, that I think that this was like in December of last year. Um, if there was a there was a predominant white male response of I will show up. And there was a predominant no one else response of no thank you. And so there was a huge concern that fishing trials forward under those circumstances, you know, could have a positive or negative effect depending on like your client, but it wouldn't necessarily be the representative jury that we want to see as the peers, to the extent that we have that in these large counties, but you wouldn't have that. And so it could really have some skewed results that would be more detrimental than waiting to go to trial, um, which is why they try to release as many people as they can. But clearly if you're charged with something really violent, you know, we, we can't always have people running around when there's enough information to not release them. Any other questions? I don't know what they're going to do with the backlog. Um, court four, which is the family violence court, has the biggest one. And so who knows when we'll get through all of those cases. Um, and we can't do Zoom juries. We had a Zoom jury last August. I watched the whole thing in JP5. We had our first cat juror, our first dog juror, We're like running around on the couch. With the <laughs> you know, the prosecutor's making their closing argument. This is a traffic ticket, but the prosecutor's making their closing Zoom argument, and the lady's like petting her cat, and the dog running back and forth, you know, and I'm like, oh yeah, they're not paying attention. And then like, we had two different jurors that are like drinking something that looks suspiciously like beer, and you're just like, <laughs> Well, I'm going to push back on you on that because civil judges have been doing virtual jury trials for almost six months and they are very clear about the jurors watching them and not drinking. I think criminal has decided for, of course, due process reasons to only do it in person. But um, I will say the district court uh, judges virtual has really got control over those jurors and they found ways to make it where you don't. I mean, that was the first time we ever did it in person, you know, virtually was with judge. She, but they really tightened up since then. Well, and you know, I think that for I think that for the people that want that option of doing a Zoom trial and taking the risks that come with it in terms of not being in person and not being in the courtroom, um, I think that that definitely is a way to make sure that that they are heard. I think that you know most of us that do criminal defense, I feel like it would be malpractice to like agree to it. Now that doesn't mean that we couldn't be forced into it if the judge is forced us down that path. I think the Supreme Court um, won't let that. But I don't I don't see that happening. And I would say that there, just like with email and, and other things, there is, there is a loss of empathy when you are on a screen and you're trying to communicate with people and you need them to see your client as being human and someone that is worth saving and, and listening to. And you can't get that with, with Zoom. You're just not, I, I, I've been dealing with juries for a very long time and it just would be such a disservice and risk to the client, I think, to, to go on Zoom for that reason. You know, hearings and stuff like that are very different, but jurors are in their own So anyway, all right. Anybody else? All right. Well, thank you so that much for having me. Thank you. I think everybody would agree that was an amazing uh, presentation. Um, before we finish up this afternoon, um, we will do uh, our draws. Um, Petla has an umbrella, a couple of door prizes. We have a gift card to we have a DWI out there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that may be a wreck. I don't know. Oh, yeah, we do now. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Kath is going to give a gift card of $25, um, as well as a beautiful Kappa umbrella. 
Anybody? You guys have seen these yet? But we'll do the umbrella first. Okay. This goes to Cynthia Divini. Divini. Amazon gift card goes to Elizabeth Morgan. So I'm going to email that to you. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay. And then now we have Debbie will come up from the Legal Connection and talk a little bit about her services. And she also has something for a special prize winner. Good afternoon, everybody. I think y'all can hear me just fine. It's good yes. to see everybody's faces after such a long, long time. And I'm the owner and founder of The Legal Connection. We've been around for a little bit. And uh, I have 56 employees in South Austin. Uh, corporate office, we're doing uh, mostly state work here in Texas. Uh, we do also have federal cases that we work on. And we're obtaining evidence from anywhere in the United States. So we do uh, court reporting, uh, record retrieval, process service, 